Hello and welcome to Ogmore by Sea Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's great that you can join me as we continue to read through the book of 2 Samuel, which is the book that we're reading through in May 2024. We've reached chapter 15, and a lot has happened. David is now on the throne, he rules over all of Israel, and he has had success in all the wars going on because the Lord has granted him victory. But then he messed up big time in chapter 11 in the famous episode where he sleeps with Bathsheba, who is the wife of Uriah the Hittite and daughter of Eliam. And they were two mighty men of David's army. Um, And then he just acts wickedly. David acts absolutely wickedly. He tries to cover it up. He's found out. The Lord knows. He's confronted and he repents. But then there are still consequences. So the son that is born to David by Bathsheba dies. and But then there are more consequences from the fallout of David's sin. And you get two of David's sons, other sons, Amnon and Absalom, and they are like caricature exaggerations of David's sin. So you have Amnon that epitomizes David's lust, and then you have Absalom that epitomizes David's murderous um, cover-up, really, because Amnon sleeps with his sister Tamar, and Tamar is just a victim in all of this, and it is hard to read. But then Absalom kills Amnon and wants to get away with it. Uh, And now Absalom has been brought back into Jerusalem, and I'm pretty sure by this point he has also confronted the king, uh, because He wasn't happy um, being limited, not being allowed into the king's presence. But now he's going to make a a claim to the throne himself. And it's going to get messier. It is going to get messier. But through it all, we see that God is at work. And even through the wickedness and the schemes of people, the Lord brings about his glorious purposes. So he's not, um, he's not the author of sin. The Lord uh, can't be held responsible for all the wickedness. And yet the Lord uses the wickedness to serve his loving purposes. That's the hope that we have. Right. Before we dive into chapter 15, let's pray because we certainly need it. And isn't it wonderful and exciting that the author of scripture and the Lord of all history has promised to be with us and he can help us yeah so let's pray let's pray heavenly father we thank you so much for your word and we thank you that you don't sweep all the mess of this world under the carpet but you confront it and that you work even through it to bring about your loving purposes so father please grant us faith by your holy spirit please be with us now through him and fix our eyes on jesus the king of kings the son of David. In his name we ask. Amen. Amen. And that reminds me that Jesus needs to be in the forefront of our minds as we read through all of the Bible, whether it's New Testament or Old Testament, and especially here as we're dealing with people who are literally the sons of David. And it would be the the son of David who is to reverse the curse to bring about the blessing of Abraham that's promised all the way back to Abraham. Um, So yes, the son of David, and clearly Absalom is going to, in one way or another, point to Jesus, but it is often uh, showing a skewed picture, or it's showing the photo negative of who Jesus, the true son of David, is, because that's often how the Old Testament works. Uh, You have the photo negative, where you have the failure but then where Jesus comes and he succeeds for us. So let's dive in. I hope you're doing well, by the way, and I pray this is a blessing to you. 2 Samuel chapter 15 verse 1. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him. What town are you from? He would answer. 
your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me, and I would see that they receive justice. It's all very sneaky, isn't it? Usurping the throne, the authority of his father, David. He's getting down and he is with the people saying, wouldn't you be better off if I were on the throne? Then you would have real justice. Um, he's a self-made man in a way, isn't it? You have David who is placed on the throne and chosen by the living God. And then you have Absalom who is grasping for authority for himself. Verse 5. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice, and so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. Somewhat of a flatterer, you could say. So he's not recognising people bowing down before him, but he wants to get down on their level and welcome them. And there is something Christ-like in that, isn't it? Because Jesus is the highest authority and he is the son of David and he stoops down and washes his disciples' feet. He doesn't just get down on our level, he serves us. It's amazing really, isn't it? But the purpose, the motivation is entirely different when we compare and contrast Absalom with Jesus because Absalom is doing this for his own selfish uh, his own selfish ends. He wants to do this because he wants to get something out of the Israelites. He wants to be popular in order to ascend to the throne, whereas Jesus doesn't need to clamber up and climb on people and manipulate people. He gives up and he is selfless. Verse 7, at the end of four years... Absalom said to the king, let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. While your servant was living at Gesher in Aram, I made this vow. If the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. The king said to him, go in peace. So he went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gil Gilonite, David's counsellor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's following kept on increasing. So he is really making a run for it, isn't it? And this is the first time we have met this character, Ahithophel. And what's interesting about Ahithophel, it was pointed out to me when we studied 2 Samuel 11 in depth, that Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. Eliam was his son, who was one of the mighty men of David. And then... Bathsheba was born to him. So Ahithophel, quite possibly, secretly hated David. Although he was well respected and he was on the council of David and would give him advice, he despised David because of the wicked thing that David had done to Bathsheba, his granddaughter. And we're going to meet Ahithophel later on. Verse 13, a messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. So clearly David knew what kind of man his son Absalom was. Absalom had showed his hand already by taking the
the law into his own hands when he killed Amnon, his brother. And he had also manipulated the whole situation so that all of the sons of David were gathered together when he killed Amnon. He is an influential person, quite charismatic, uh, magnetic personality, you could say. But there are people out there today who have got all the charisma in the world, but who lead people astray. And if you follow them, you will end up being more lost than ever. Absalom is a bad king. But Jesus, he is the one who stands at the door and knocks. And he isn't all about manipulation. There's a time when it said that he didn't entrust himself to the people when he was growing in popularity because he knew what was in each person. And I take that to mean that Jesus doesn't need us and he's not there to manipulate us or to be this influential, public, political figure. He is the I am. We need him. But it's a very different story for Absalom. Verse 15, the king's officials answered him, your servants are ready to do whatever our lord the king chooses. So the servants' loyalty backfired on them when David went a wrong way, but it now helps him out a great deal, doesn't it? That his officials are with him. Verse 16, the king set out with his entire household following him, but he left 10 concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out with all the people following him and they halted at the edge of the city. All his men marched past him along with all the Kerithites and Pelethites and all the 600 Gittites who had accompanied him from Gath marched before the king. The fact that he left 10 of his concubines back to take care of the palace will come up later. So bear that in mind. Verse 19, the king said to Ittai, the Gittite, why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom. You are a foreigner and an exile from your homeland. You came only yesterday, and today shall I make you wander about with us when I do not know where I'm going? Go back and take your people with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. There's a footnote on faithfulness that I want to click on. It says that's the Subtuagent translation, the Hebrew. May kindness and faithfulness be with you. Interesting. Verse 21, but Ittai replied to the king, as surely as the Lord lives. And that's a phrase that comes up a number of times, isn't it? And I guess if you were going to sum up the Lord God, who he is and how he's described in 1 and 2 Samuel, then the living God is probably a good description. As surely as the Lord lives and as my Lord the king lives, wherever my Lord the king may be, Wherever it means life or death, there will your servant be. David said to Ittai, go ahead, march on. So Ittai the Gittite marched on with all his men and the families that were with him. It's an amazing loyalty here, isn't it? David feels awkward about it because apparently they haven't known each other for that long. Um, and I'm not sure if that's absolutely true. I think David is giving him an out here. <laughs> But Ittai does something similar to what Ruth does with Naomi, isn't it? Saying, like, I'm, I'm bound to you by my love for you. I know I don't have to be with you, but I want to be with you. And there is this real spirit-filled loyalty, the unity that comes through the spirit in the bonds of peace. And that shows itself here verse 23 the whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by the king also crossed the Kidron valley and all the people moved on towards the wilderness now I think the Kidron valley happens crops up again later as Jesus Christ is being opposed by dark forces 
Verse 24, Zadok was there too. He was the priest, uh, or the high priest even. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God and Abiathar, or maybe Abiathar was high priest. They were both priests. I can't remember exactly which one was the high priest. They set down the Ark of God and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. And in all this, I feel like David knew that trouble was to be met in a godly way. It's like we we get that we need to be consecrated and give thanks and be about the business of God and doing things his way when things are going well. But in my mind, there's the church climate of the West, which is hard if if I'm honest it's slow it I've been thinking about that parable of the kingdom of God coming secretly and gradually um, like a woman taking some yeast and kneading it kneading the yeast throughout the dough until the whole batch is leavened and it's slow and sure and I feel like that's kind of summing up how things are in terms of ministry in the UK today in general, in general, that's my experience. Anyway, things might be changing. I pray that it will. I pray that the heavens would open and the spirit is poured out and there's revival. And yeah, that we would be praying for that. Um, but there are, there are declines and churches are closing. And in all this, there is a godly way to, to go about decline. Let's move on. Verse 25, then the king said to Zadok, take the ark of God back into the city. If I find favour in the, in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. And it's hard to compare and contrast David with Saul because we were with Saul such a long time ago now. But this response typifies the difference, is that Saul was self-righteously defending himself to the last, whereas David is open and submissive to what the Lord wants, trusting that the Lord knows best and that the Lord ways is good. And so he is... Um, here at least, humbly saying, the Lord's will be done, your will be done, your kingdom come, that kind of stuff. Verse 27, the king also said to Zadok the priest, do you understand? Go back to the city with my blessing. And here David is also showing that he doesn't consider the ark of God as some kind of talisman, like a charm that if they have, then they're just magically going to have success. He knows that it represents the throne of God and him leaving it in Jerusalem is an act of faith and hope, not in wishful thinking, but he wants to come and see it. He wants to return and the change in circumstances will be because that the throne has been re-established for David himself. Um, but this is going to confuse maybe the priests. So he's saying, Look, do you get it? Like, go back with my blessing. And he continues in verse 27, take your son Ahimeaz with you and also Abiathar's son Jonathan. You and Abiathar return with your two sons. I will wait at the fords in the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar took the ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there. If you want to be really cynical and boil this down to mere psychology, then I guess he wants some people on the inside who are really on his side. But I see this as an act of faith. Verse 30, but David continued up the Mount of Olives. Now we know the Mount of Olives. There's another king that was crossed the Kidron Valley and was in the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. Hmm. 
his head was covered and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. Now David had been told, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. When David arrived at the summit, where people used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there to meet him, his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, If you go with me, you'll be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, Your majesty, I will be your servant. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I will be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Ahithophel's advice. Won't the priests Zadok and Abiathar be there with you? Tell them anything you hear in the king's palace. Their two sons, Ahimeaz, son of Zadok, and Jonathan, son of Abiathar, are there with them. Send them to me with anything you hear. So here goes beyond the uh, the act of faith, and this is the, the shrewd dealings of David. He does want people who are on the inside to give him some intel, and also someone to confound the wisdom of Ahithophel. He knows that he's a force to be reckoned with. So Hushai, David's confidant, arrived at Jerusalem as Absalom was entering the city. Are you still with me? Can we do another chapter or five? <laughs> Let's see how we go. <clears throat> when David had gone a short distance beyond the summit, there was Ziba, the steward of Mephibosheth, waiting to meet him. And this is an interesting story to trace throughout the book of 2 Samuel. Do you remember Mephibosheth? He was son of Jonathan, son of Saul. And because he was part of Saul's household, then it would have been obvious that he was to be considered as an enemy of David because Saul was dead against David, and hated him, tried to kill him a number of times. And so if David really wanted to remove any threat of someone trying to usurp his authority and put someone in David of, of Saul's family back on the throne, then Mephibosheth would have been a possibility. But instead, David doesn't just let him off the hook, he welcomes him, and Mephibosheth ate at the king's table like one of his sons. So shown grace, undeserved love. And Ziba was the servant of Saul, and he, I think he had like 20 servants of his own, and, and he had sons, so, and, uh, and Ziba was given to Mephibosheth by David and ordered to look after uh, Mephibosheth, because David restored Mephibosheth's inheritance as well, so what belonged to Saul. It was given to Mephibosheth, um, but he was... Uh, his legs didn't work. We even read the story earlier on of how he was dropped as a as a baby, as an infant, and so he couldn't walk. But there was also provision that David said Ziba and the servants of Saul would look after Mephibosheth's fields and all that. So anyway, Ziba was there, waiting to meet David. Ziba had a string of donkeys saddled and loaded with 200 loaves of bread, a 100 cakes of raisins, a 100 cakes of figs, and a skin of wine. The king asked Ziba, Why have you brought these? Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. The bread and fruit are for the men to eat, and the wine is to refresh those who become exhausted in the wilderness. The king then asked, Where is your master's grandson? Ziba said to him, he is staying in Jerusalem because he thinks today the Israelites will restore to me my grandfather's kingdom. Then the king said to Ziba, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And we've got to be suspicious as we read through all this. David has been a bit sneaky in... Is it sneaky or is it just sensible and wise. I don't know, make up your own mind. But here, 
what is Zebra up to? He is well prepared and he is providing all this stuff for David in his time of need, showing where his allegiance is. But then he says, and there's not Mephibosheth here to agree with him, but it is a bit odd, isn't it? It's a bit odd for Zeba to say that Mephibosheth ha believes that this is going to be the time where he's going to go on the throne. Why on earth would David leaving and his murderous son grasping, like claiming the crown for himself, why is this going to be the time where Mephibosheth of all people is going to have his have the kingdom given to him? It seems a bit bizarre. And yet, that's what Zeba says. And because of that, David says, all that Mephibosheth has is now yours. I humbly bow, Zeba said. May I find favour in your eyes, my lord the king. It's not the end of the story, by the way. We'll have to try and remember that as we pick up it. Spoiler alert, David returns to Jerusalem. Verse 5. As King David approached Bahurim, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimei, Shimei, son of Gera, and he cursed as he came out. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones, though all the troops and the special guard were on David's right and left. As he cursed, Shimei said, Get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel. The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom. You have come to ruin because you are a murderer. And that's quite an interesting and angry accusation, isn't it? Because the Lord gave David a couple of opportunities to kill Saul if he had wanted to. But David didn't. David spared Saul on a number of occasions, and then it wasn't David who struck down Saul and Jonathan. And in fact, when he heard the news that Saul and uh, Jonathan, Saul and Jonathan had died in battle with the Philistines, the is it an Amalekite that came thinking that it was good news to share with David? He had him killed. <laughs> um, and so, and so, this is obviously incredibly biased, and you've got to feel for the guy. I mean, Shimei probably was quite glad to have his brethren on the throne, um, with all the the glory that would have come with it, and all the provision that would have come with it, and it was taken away from him, and he was ashamed. But now he's gloating over. David going through trouble and yeah so it's, it's not true and yet let's see how uh, how David responds then Abishai son of Zeruiah said to the king why should this dead dog curse my lord the king let me go over and cut off his head <laughs> but the king said what does this have to do with you you sons of Zeruiah the sons of Zeruiah are, um, they were very skilled at fighting, but they got, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is typical of the way that they behave, isn't it? Is Joab also a son of Zeruiah? I can't remember. I'm not going to look it up now. We'll find out later on. But the king said, what does this have to do with you? If he is cursing because the... If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, curse David, who can ask, why do you do this? David then said to Abishai and all his officials, my son, my own flesh, flesh and blood is trying to kill me. How much more then, this Benjaminite, leave him alone, let him curse for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look upon my misery and restore to me his covenant blessing instead of his curse today. 
So David and his men continued along the road while Shimei was going along the hillside opposite him, cursing as he went and throwing stones at him and showering him with dirt. The king and all the people with him arrived at their destination exhausted, and there he refreshed himself. So a couple of things to mention. Most notably in my mind, first is David's understanding of the providence of God that he doesn't fight his corner because he believes that the Lord is at work even in the cursing of Shimei. Even though it's shameful, even though um, he, he could have sorted it out, he didn't, um, he, he didn't take judgment into his own hands in this instance. But then... If you read some of the Psalms that David writes about the people that curse him, it's not like David wasn't affected in his heart and it wasn't like David didn't want justice to be done. He's praying some very strong prayers for the Lord to take up his course and to judge his enemies. So there is that. Um, but he accepts it trusting in God's that God's in control and that God is good even if it's miserable right now but also here is the cursed king here is this king who willingly submits to being cursed trusting that this is the road to ultimate blessing I say ultimate it's not the ultimate blessing but it's a picture of it isn't it because Jesus went a similar geographical route and it was the path of curse. He was rejected, he was mocked, but as Jesus died for sin and he was sin for us, as he was cursed and hung on the tree and he was crowned with thorns which represent the curse, we're told back in Genesis 3, he's crowned with curse. And yet it is through that coronation that we have ultimate blessing. That's the fount of all blessing. And I guess another point added to it is humility. Verse 15. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the men of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel was with him. Then Hushai, the archite, David's confidant, went to Absalom and said to him, Long live the king, long live the king. Absalom said to Hushai, so this is the love you show your friend. If he's your friend, why didn't you go with him? Hushai said to Absalom, no, the one chosen by the Lord, by these people and by all the men of Israel, his I will be, and I will remain with him. Furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve the son, just as I served your father? So I will serve you. He's obviously been in political spheres, hasn't he? Because he's got some very smooth words. He talks the talk, doesn't he? Absalom said to Ahithophel, give us your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel answered, sleep with your father's concubines, whom he has left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself obnoxious to your father and the hands of everyone will with you will be more resolute. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And so there's a couple of things. Ahithophel was, as we said before, Bathsheba's grandfather. And so this is a vicious recompense that he meets out. Maybe he's been waiting for just this opportunity to shame the whole family of David this way. And it's advice. He says to shame um, David, and it's got the pragmatic purpose of driving this wedge between David and Absalom so that the people aren't going to think, well, we can, why, why can't we just have peace? Know that you need to pick a side. Absalom will become obnoxious to David. That was his purpose. But I mean, this advice is really against Absalom as well, isn't it? And it 
it is just ironic in a dark way that Absalom was so vehemently against Amnon, his brother, when he slept with Tamar, their sister. And now Absalom is again involved in this incestuous debauchery. It's such a mess, isn't it? But this is Ahithophel's advice. And we read in verse 23, Now in those days the advice Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. That was how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. And he had built up this reputation so that now when he's got his chance for revenge, he's going to have a receptive ear. Ahithophel said to Absalom, I would choose 12,000 men and set out tonight in pursuit of David. I would attack him while he is weary and weak. I would strike him with terror and then all the people with him will flee. I would, I would strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. The death of the man you seek will mean the return of all. All the people will be unharmed. This plan seemed good to Abs Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. It makes an awful lot of sense, doesn't it? But Absalom said, summon also Hushai the archite, so that we can hear what he has to say as well. When Hushai came to him, Absalom said, Ahithophel has given this advice. Should we do what he says? If not, give us your opinion. Hushai replied to Absalom, the advice Ahithophel has given is not good this time. You know your father and his men, they are fighters, and as fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Besides, your father is an experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. Even now he's hidden in a cave or some other place. If he should attack your troops first, whoever hears about it will say, there has been a slaughter among the troops who follow Absalom, then even the bravest soldier, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt in fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a fighter, and that those with him are brave. So I advise you, let all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, be gathered to you, with you yourself leading them into battle. Then we will attack him wherever he may be found, and we will fall on him as dew settles on the ground, Neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. Alive, If he withdraws into a city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city and we will drag it down to the valley until not so much as a pebble is left. It's an interesting contrast, isn't it? Ahithophel is like, strike now. And just get David. Like, go now while they're weak and just kill David. Whereas Hushai puts it in like clever language so that he paints it in such an appealing way, doesn't he? Saying, look, this is dangerous. And he kind of slyly bigs up David to make it all very scary. It's like, you can't defeat him now. And if you go now with such a small force, then you're going to lose and then you're not going to be able to establish your reign at all because everyone's going to uh, say Absalom can't win. But then it's like the, painting this picture of this glorious battle. And it just goes to show, doesn't it, of how much our imagination plays a role in our actions and what we think is possible and how we make decisions. Um, yeah, is that kind of vision casting? Is that a buzzword? But it's just the nature of things, isn't it? If you can visualise something and if if something looks appealing, I think it's probably how um, cognitive behaviour therapy works as well. And it's that re recalibrating your mind. And Hushai's advice is painting this picture of this doomed way which is a Ahithophel's way but then there is this really better way it's glorious it's like bringing everyone together and 
just descending on them in this overwhelming force and everyone's going to be destroyed so not just David but everyone and then it's going to be sure and it seems like strange advice if he's supposed to be on David's side you're like whoa really but it's because he's so good at painting the picture and selling the story and as we as I chat to people about Jesus and about where different people are coming from I wonder whether because it's the stories that we tell it's the story that makes sense of who we are and how we see the world and and I think people need to know the better story of Jesus and this isn't like political spin this is about how we make decisions and people need to see the beauty of Jesus and the the better story that makes sense for us to to go with Jesus it's not so much about it's not so much about arguing and yes we can answer questions and there are reasons and that but it's the big story that makes sense of all of everything isn't it that's how we make decisions it's the stories that we hold to anyway here we go verse 14 absalom and all the men of israel said the advice of hushai the archite is better than that of ahithophel for the lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of ahithophel in order to bring disaster on absalom which for, for all of david's like cleverness in planting his own guys on the enemy's side the deciding factor is that the lord was on his side the lord had determined to frustrate the good advice so there we go um it's the lord verse 15 hushai told zadok and abiathar the priests Ahithophel has advised Absalom and the elders of Israel to do such and such, but I have advised them to do so and so. Now send a message at once and tell David, do not spend the night at the fords in the wilderness, cross over without fail, or the king and all the people with him will be swallowed up. Jonathan and Ahimeaz were staying at Enrogel. A female servant was to go and inform them, and they were to go and tell King David for they could not risk being seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So the two of them left at once and went to the house of a man in Bahurim. He had a well in his courtyard and they climbed down into it. His wife took a covering and spread it out over the opening of the well and scattered corn over it. No one knew anything about it. It reminds you a bit of Jericho isn't it hiding spies messages verse 20 when absalom's men came to the woman at the house they asked where are ahimeaz and jonathan the woman answered they crossed over the brook the men searched but found no one so they returned to jerusalem after they had gone the two climbed out of the well and went to inform king david they said to him set out and cross the river at once Ahithophel had, has advised such and such against you. So David and all the people with him set out and crossed the Jordan. By daybreak, no one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. When Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. Suicide is a real problem, should go without saying. And if you have suicidal thoughts, please speak to someone. The Samaritans do an amazing work. You can get in touch with me and there is meaning to life. So if you or someone that you know struggles with suicidal thoughts then please speak to someone don't do it alone and here ahithophel his whole identity was bound up in his reputation of giving advice like those that inquire of god 
And so when things didn't go his way, it felt crushing to him and that he had lost the purpose of his life and he gave up. But it's a tragedy because there is purpose. There's more to life than just what you do. And there's a conversation going on in our society at the moment about euthanasia. Although they've changed the terminology now. Um, the, the word to describe it is really assisted dying these days. But the real danger, I think, underneath it all, is that I believe, because the Lord says it, that we are made in the image of God. And so we, being image bearers of the living God, no matter what we do or our capabilities, we have worth. And Jesus says, like, just kind of in passing what can someone give in exchange for the soul if they had their whole if they had the whole world then it it couldn't like it couldn't buy their soul in other words he's saying like people are so valuable people are so precious and that's irrespective of what you can contribute or what you can give and so all this nonsense about not wanting to be a burden on society or a burden on the family for forget about all that we are glad to have people who need us that need to be served that need to be helped what a wonderful privilege because it's better to give than to receive there is dignity to life and the lord is the giver of life and our times are in his hands so all this plays into the the current cultural debate about euthanasia really doesn't it Life is far more than just, your life and who you are is far more than just what you do. Ultimately, it's found in Jesus, isn't it? That's where we find our worth. And it's not about what we've earned, but we are, we are blessed with a free gift of God that cost Jesus everything. Right. It's important stuff, but throughout all this, I think the main thing is just if you have suicidal thoughts, don't go it alone. You're worth so much and the Lord loves you. There's a better way. Let's keep reading. Verse 24. David went to Mahanaim and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Absalom, he managed to summon the whole army of Israel the Israelites very quickly didn't they they swapped their allegiance pretty or did they well Absalom had spent years seducing them so I guess it's paid off for him or so it looks like at this point verse 25 Absalom had point had appointed Amasa over the army in place of Joab Amasa was the son of Jether an Ishmaelite who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, and sister of Zeruiah, the mother of Joab. The Israelites and Absalom camped in the land of Gilead. When David came to Mahanaim, Shobi, son of Nahash, from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Machir, son of Amiel, from Lodiba, and Barzillai, the Gileadite, from Rogelim brought bedding and bowls and articles of pottery. They also brought wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, sheep and cheese from cows, milk for David and his people to eat. For they said the people have become exhausted and hungry and thirsty in the wilderness. David mustered the men. Are you still with me? <laughs> it seems crazy to, to stop now. We're on a roll. We're in the thick of it. So let's keep reading if we can. Um, and I guess just quick comment is that although on the whole they were now rebelling against David and wanted to set Absalom on the throne but there are still pockets that are loyal and absolutely loyal to David and providing for his men. For chapter 18 David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds 
So it's still a very sizable troop, isn't it? David sent out his troops, a third under the command of Joab, a third under Joab's brother, Abishai, son of Zeruiah. So there we go. That's what we were asking earlier. Abishai, Abishai wanted to knock off Shimei's head when he was cursing David. So yeah, they're brothers. And a third under Ittai, the Gittite. And Ittai has proved his loyalty uh, already, hasn't he? The king told the troops, I myself will surely march out with you. But the men said, you must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. Even if half of us die, they won't care. But you are worth 10,000 of us. It would be better now for you to give us support from the city. The king answered, I will do whatever seems best to you. Hmm. So the king stood beside the gate while all his men marched out in units of hundreds and of thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai and Ittai, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. It's another one of David's surprising attitude towards people who are out to kill him. David's army marched out. Well, maybe it will come up again later but it's interesting that they all heard the king giving orders about Absalom which on a practical level if that is going to happen then everyone needs to know and that's the plan but it's got to be a discouragement isn't it when David is saying <laughs> it's, it's like the subtext is David do you really want to win this battle when the commander of this army that well the 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 would-be king the one who's proclaimed himself to be king in your place who wants you dead you want to spare his life so you're not really <laughs> making it easy for yourself are you and it can't be that encouraging <clears throat> confusing <clears throat> sorry verse 6 David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There Israel, Israel's troops were routed by David's men and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside and the forest swallowed up more men that, more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the, the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair, while the mule he was riding kept on going. When one of the men saw what had happened, he told Joab, I've just seen Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Uh, a detail about Absalom that we read of when we're first introduced to him is that he was very handsome and he had particularly thick and long hair he had it cut once a year and he used to weigh it out of his pride so the hair kind of epitomizes his pride and vanity but it got caught in a tree and he was hanging there in midair job said to the man who had told him this what? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have had, then I would have ha had to give you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, even if a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. In our hearing, the king commanded you and Ab Abishai and Ittai, protect the young man Absalom for my sake. There's loads of footnotes around here. I want to click on that one where it says, For my sake. A few Hebrew manuscripts, so Tuagent, Vulgate, and Syriac. Most Hebrew manuscripts may be translated Absalom, whoever you may be. Protect the young man Absalom, whoever you may be, instead of for my sake. So if it is whoever you may be it's saying whether you're a commander or whether you're just an infantry or whether you're riding on a horse whoever you are protect Absalom interesting um, we got to verse 13 
And if I had put my life in jeopardy, then, and nothing is hidden from the king. Oh, and if I had put my life in jeopardy, and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have, you would have kept your distance from me. Job said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And ten of Joab's armour bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him and killed him. Gruesome stuff. Then Joab sounded the trumpet and the troops stopped pursuing Israel for Joab halted them. They took Absalom, threw him into a big pit in the forest and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. During his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the king's valley as a monument to himself, for he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's mon monument to this day. So the monument is another sign of his vanity. But here is a son of David who is seeking to rule God's people. But he ends up caught between heaven and earth, hanging on a tree, and there smitten and afflicted, and he dies. And then he's taken down and thrown into a tomb covered with large stones. Does it remind you of another son of David? The one who was crowned with curse, the one who was strung up on a tree in midair between heaven and earth as if rejected by both and suffered. He was smitten and afflicted and then he breathed his last and he was taken down and he was placed in a tomb with a large stone over the entrance. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Verse 19, now Ahimeaz, son of Zadok, said, let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has vindicated him by delivering him from the hand of his enemies. Now, Ahimeaz, maybe he's thinking this is a way to make a name for himself. Does he know <laughs> how he treated people who were bringing news of those he thought that David's enemies, but David bizarrely wanted to show mercy and was grieved about? You are not the one to take the news today, Job told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. And Joab is an interesting character. I know I say the word interesting a lot, but it's hard to describe, isn't it? Um, when, uh, yeah, there's a mixture of good and bad. Like Joab was, a, um, yeah, he proves himself loyal and faithful and fearsome and all this. And he carries out uh, the murder of Uriah, not still at the hands of the Ammonites, but, you know, he goes along with the nasty cover-up plot of David's. But here, it seems like he's taking responsibility because he knows David. Then Job said to a Cushite, <laughs> oh, no, he's not, is he? <laughs> he's not taking responsibility. He is giving someone the ultimate hospital pass. A hospital pass in rugby is when you pass the ball to someone in order for them to get clobbered. <laughs> um, yeah, he knows what's going to happen. And so he gives it to a Cushite to bear the message to the king. Go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Job and ran off. Oh, man. Like the Lord have mercy on such a person who is just carrying out his duty. Ahimeaz, Ahimeaz, son of Zadok, again said to Job, Come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. But Job replied, My son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring you a reward. 
He said, come what may, I want to run. What is going on? Why does Ahimeaz want to do this? <clears throat> he must be convinced that there's something in it for him. But Joab knows David better. So Joab said, run. Then Ahimeaz ran by way of the plain and outran the Cushite. There's a mercy. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall. As he looked out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another runner and he called down to the gatekeeper. Look, another man running alone. The king said, he must be bringing good news too. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? There's one man alone, it's good news. There's a man with him. Oh, it's more good news then. They're not together. Well, obviously, maybe it's just a, a little detail of how messages were sent and how they were known from a ways off. The watchman said, It seems to me that the first one runs like Ahimeaz, son of Zadok. He's a good man, the king said. He comes with good news. Then Ahimeaz called out to the king, All is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, Praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hand against my lord, the king. The king asked, Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimeaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant, but I, <laughs> but I don't know what it was. <laughs> oh, how sneaky. He wanted to tell a good bit. He wanted the glory, didn't he? And he is lumping in this poor guy. The king said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, my lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by, del by delivering you from the hand of all those who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, oh, Ab oh my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I died instead of you, oh Absalom, my son, my son. The Cushite was lucky to spare his life, but it was still proper rotten, wasn't it, of Ahimeaz to go with the good news and leave the Cushite to say the bad news. And what is really surprising in all this is that David is still so heartbroken, and I wonder whether there's a, something, of a, something of a reflection of the Lord's heart to the lost world in all this. In all the complexities, there is this grief and this love for people that he, he longs to share life with and know and, and bless and be blessed by. And, and they're lost to him. And even though they're in rebellion against him, I wonder whether all that is something of a reflection in David where he's lost his son and even though his son hated him and shamed him and was out to kill him he's still heartbroken for him Joab was told can we manage another chapter how long's the chapter I think we should try it's lunchtime for me now. And my stomach's going to start rumbling. Let's, um, no, let's leave it there. Let's leave it there and we'll pick it up fairly soon. Thank you so much for joining me. I pray that this is a blessing to you. And in all this, know that the son of David has come just as he promised he would do and that he was cursed for you so that you can receive the blessing to him be glory now and forever see you again soon god bless